Hey everybody, it's Mick Lubinskis here from Climate Salad and I am joined by my long-term friend and uh, co-founder of Pollinizer, Phil Moore. Phil, how are you doing? Hey Mick, I'm great. Uh, Phil's with Main Sequence, part of the CSIRO Innovation Fund and I uh, wanted to get uh, Phil in because he's doing some amazing work. Um, you can see in his background there, he is doing some, um, some big things around food uh, and I want to talk a bit about that mission with Main Sequence. Phil, do, do you want to tell us about um, your role and a little bit about the um, the big mission you're focused on? Thanks, Mick. So, so yeah, I'm a, I'm a partner at Main Sequence. Main Sequence was founded by Australia's National Science Agency, the CSIRO. And, um, you know, our job is to make globally significant companies that have science at their, at their core and it's a really interesting time to be doing that because, you know, the world's got some really big problems to solve. Um, but I'm an optimist. And when I look around the world that I am now in, I see answers and solutions to, to all these problems. So, you know, how do we decarbonize the planet? How do we make people more healthy? How do we make more food? Um, how do we build new new industries that 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 will pay people well for decades to come as the new world kind of emerges. And, and one of those big challenge areas that we have, we call feed 10 billion people. So it's literally, that's how we, that's the question we ask ourselves is how do we, how do we do that? Um, and, and, and the, the very specific question that we ask when we're looking at new opportunities is how do we make twice as much food with half the planet? And, and yeah, you know, this is this is this is one of the things that has inspired me when I since I joined CSIRO when I became a venture capitalist after I worked together at Pollinizer, Mick. I I never imagined myself wearing white Wellington boots and hairnets quite so much as I do today in in all these companies that are making making new food. But in CSIRO, I learned just how important this job is. And I also learned what an incredible contribution venture capital and entrepreneurship can play in actually bringing that to life. So, so what's, what's the problem? So we've, we're, obviously we're a growing population. We're going to be 10 billion people over the next few decades. Um, those people are going to, that means we need more food, more people. Um, each person is becoming generally more wealthy, therefore is eating more food. It is eating a richer diet. It's also eating a less sustainable diet. They're eating more meat and things like that. And what that means is we're running right up against planetary boundaries. In fact, we've breached many of them. So there's, uh, you know, our phos phosphorus flows are breached. We're using too much of the fresh water. We're emitting too much greenhouse gas. Um, and we just can't, it's just literally against the laws of physics to make more food. So this causes a problem for, <laughs> for humanity, but also a very good investment thesis. There is, there is no version of the world in which we're not going to need more food. Um, and there's also no version of earth that can deal with making food in the same <laughs> way that we make it today. So we have to make food more efficiently we have to reduce waste and we have to think about what food is, you know, as a very sort of core question to, to solve that. Now, if you, if you look back at, um, uh, at, at agriculture, science has already done an amazing job. Um, if, if we were making food today, uh, like we made food in 1961, we'd actually already need two and a half times planet earth to actually get that done um, and so science has done an incredible job but also arguably it's been uh, fairly damaging to the earth in doing that you know the soil has lost so much of its nutrition all these problems with sort of water use and sort of desertification is happening um, at a massive rate you know I, I heard an academic describe humans as desert makers um, recently which i thought Ouch. was yeah, a powerful idea yeah and yeah that's what we do we just we we go and and and, and consume resources to get what we get what we need to to survive and at, at an industrial scale that's that's scary i am um, um, i um i watched um the matrix with my son on the weekend and um and with, with my wife and the the um the matrix refers to humans as a virus 
that consumes resources. Um, and it's a, it's a bit from 1999, but I think in today's context and hearing about desert makers, you really think about that in a, in a different way. So, yeah. Exactly. Uh, exactly. So, and so one of the, one of the areas that um, um, I'm very interested in is actually thinking about what the, what the food is. I mean, we do, um, uh, yeah, we, we make food in a very inefficient way, in fact, today. So if you think about um, uh, a nice steak, um, what have we done there? You know, well, we've, we've, we've grown lots of soybeans, for example, and we found lots of water and we fed that to cows. And then the cows have you know, manufactured meat as they've grown. And then we've put the cows through the production line and we've made, uh, you know, we've made the steak. Um, but it's an incredibly inefficient way of, of making food. And the food is ultimately a thing which we, which we put in the, in the recipes that we love. So I have a, I have a strong belief that, that we, we cannot, like the hardest job of all, the jo and the job that we probably won't pull off is to force humans to change what they cook for their dinner. You know, I think, I think we can have some effect on that, but if you look at the vegan population of Earth, it's not many people sort of depending on which country you're in, it's sort of around 3%. So that's kind of how many people will dramatically change their diet based on a kind of, a, a kind of belief of making a better planet. And everyone else just kind of, you know, they're used to eating burgers and they're used to having a barbecue and they're used to um, just having all the recipes that, the, that their parents cook for them. And so I think it's very interesting to find ways of giving the people what they want, but making it in a different way, which is uh, just as nutritious, comparable in terms of experience and, and cost, but, but extremely sustainable for the planet. So companies like V2 Food, they're making, they're making meat from plants. It means you don't have that whole part of the production cycle, which is the cow bit. You just go from the soybean straight to the meat. Uh, and then there's the really interesting area of, of actually making the, the, the core components of food. So we have, um, we have Clara Foods in our portfolio that are making eggs uh, without the chickens. We have Eden Brew in our company that's making dairy and milk essentially without the cows um, and we have nourish ingredients who are making fat animal fat without without the animals and um and <clears throat> you know if we if we take that for example um we've got um an emerging problem in in all these alternate proteins and and meats where which we kind of we we discovered this for ourselves actually investing in these companies and building companies that are making alternate kinds of meat um, and realize that fat is just just where so much of the the experience uh, 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 and the sort of wonderful experience of food comes from so imagine imagine bacon without the you know without that beautiful strip of fat that gets all crispy in the frying pan or pork belly without the without the fat on top or wagyu without the veins of fat running through it or um, it, it, it's, it's so much of the mouthfeel, it's so much of the taste. Um, and so, but many of the companies are putting things like palm oil, coconut oil, things like that in there, which aren't terribly good for you. Um, and they're also the kind of the next rainforest wasteland. So if, if all protein becomes enormous and everyone uses coconut oil then we've created the next palm oil that's taking another percentage of the rainforest out so we need to find solutions uh, and not just move the problem over somewhere else but not that so nourish that's what nourish does it makes amazing fats that that you can put into into food um, that have not been made by animals but they're nature identical to what the animal would make it just makes you know milk taste creamy, you know meat melt in your mouth, and um, and it and and does so um, 
through a manufacturing process that kind of brews it like beer. Um, and so you just don't need any of those environmental problems. So it's, you know, it's exciting times and there's, there's just, there's a, there's a lot to do. Yeah. And what, and what I find is there's just, the job is just endlessly um, building out the next slab of the runway yeah. that, that this whole industry needs as it develops. Yeah, I think I want to quickly dig into that in terms of globally significant the impacts, obviously, and one of the big things that I um, am struck with personally, but and also see people talking about is, what's the point of me having a slightly shorter shower, having meat free Mondays, having a keep cup, like there's it's a it's a massive problem, tiny impacts don't matter. Um, and then and then you, so and you have all that consumer behavior change, you said, which is kind of, you know, do we do we go for consumer behavior? behavior change or do we just make better burgers but in your work and i think v2 foods is a great example we need a couple of hours to tell the full story but um, in terms of main sequence um, like finding uh, uh, something that has potential then taking it through to significant global scale to change like how can you tell us about the big steps with, within that and, and and main sequence in your role role in taking people through that journey as you said those the next big steps of track well, I think, you know, one perspective there is this is in its essence what the incredible power of science and venture coming together can do because we can not only go straight to the solution um, as well as endlessly develop it up to that point, but we can, we can get there quickly and then we can scale it rapidly to sort of get the impact that we, that, that, that we want. Um, and, you know, just, just a few years into into V2 Food that we that we co-founded with CSRO who got us straight to the science and Hungry Jacks that got us straight to global distribution and, and processing allowed us to, to change the diet of a whole bunch of people by giving them what they're eating anyway. And you know, one of, you know, one of the proudest moments for me is, is, you know, is when I go through a Hungry Jacks drive-through and I see, you know, pickup trucks in high vis best drivers you know buying uh, a rebel whopper yeah, it's fantastic it's like observing change but there's a constant job of building out the 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 production line here the supply chain and um so as an example one of the things i'm i'm working on right now we have all these precision fermentation companies who are brewing food like beer um and now what we need is these enormous factories which are going to produce the food that all these companies have have created and it's 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 enormous i mean the deficit that we have uh, on earth to actually make these is is enormous um and um, it's a hard thing to see isn't it the um you, you see one burger one egg um you know one one coffee cup but then I think that that's a, the kind of thing hidden by capitalism, I guess, is it's like throwing things away. I was saying to Olympia from Goterra, like there's no such place as a way. It just gets taken away from you magically by the elves and you, you don't have to worry about it again. Yeah. But the, the same thing is you don't have to worry about how a, how a burger is made at the moment. Someone else is dealing with that. But but we, we kind of we need to worry because the, the impacts are starting to happen around the world in terms of fires and floods and, storm, and storms, right? So, Well, I think, you know, until... Netflix started putting some of these fabulous documentaries out to educate people. <clears throat> I don't think, I don't think people had any clue at the environmental impact of the food they eat. For example, you know, I think you know we all, it's 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 understood that a coal-fired power station you know, causes greenhouse gas emissions, which are unacceptable. It's less understood what farming can do if it's done. The wrong way and i'm being very careful there to say it's not farming itself it's just some farming and it's and it's it, 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 in particular historical farming um but there is a version of farming which is um a solution to climate change which will pull carbon out of the atmosphere and put it back in the ground and we're seeing that change happening and and that's partly answering your question because we're having to operate on that level to actually understand that and actually help that and facilitate that and invest in that and get partnerships happening, as well as building these big plants that are, you know, which are 
yeah, I think I think the numbers are just for precision fermentation. There's about um, two hundred million, sorry, two hundred thousand tons of annual capacity to make this food today, and we need something like fifteen million tons by twenty thirty <laughs> on just the absolutely visible trends. So those 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 factories have to rise. I want them to happen here in Australia, so Australia can lead the sustainable food uh, revolution. Um, but, you know, I think going back to this problem of um, consumers, like I, I, am, I, am, um, I am absolutely committed to sort of solving this problem of sustainable food. But when I go to Woolworths or Coles, I don't actually know how to decide what to buy. So what's the equivalent of, of you know, putting LED light bulbs in and making those choices? Um, it's very unclear. But what we're starting to see happen, and we're participating in that with all the people that we're working with, is things like um, e-commerce apps for the different supermarkets. What if they? What if you actually had a greenhouse gas budget? Right, and you could shop, and you could say, "I only want to use the. I only want to cause this many kilos of carbon to go into the atmosphere this week." Right, and the app says, "You're you're just about to go over budget, but why don't you buy?" And it's not necessarily buy V2 or Impossible Burger. It's buy kangaroo or buy you know a more sustainable animal meat um there's lots of yeah. there's lots of solutions but we need help <laughs> there's lots of parts along the supply chain that need to be fixed yeah yeah i was um the uh the rethink x um report out recently about um hey stop trying to do 100 solutions we've got actually these nine let's just do these nine um i was struck by but yes we're missing out on uh, the game-changing things that will it'll add to it and accelerate it, and that's actually putting a lot of pressure on those. Like, given uh, precision fermentation was one of the big ones there, and obviously you've got a big believer in that. But do, do you do you think it's a matter of doubling down on the tech we've got, or do you think we need to keep exploring? Well, we've got to do a much better job at storytelling and and collaborating, because the, the, the horrible outcome here is that. The scientists keep to themselves. Uh, they've sort of failed to communicate what is powerful about what they're doing across everything that could be a solution here. And all these silos and pixels of activity have a suboptimal impact, right? And so, so yes, I do, I do believe that we need to um, agree on some agree is probably the wrong word, but I think we need to build clusters of concentration that, that lots of people just promiscuously collaborate on to, to drive massive scale as, you know, as fast as we can and really look at ways of, of, of bringing things together so that the impact can happen. So, you know, we've got things like, yeah, we've got V2 food is growing um, uh, carbon negative uh, meat effectively by growing sort of special soybeans that CSRO have developed that regrow ag is measuring is, is sort of net um, sustainable um, that's using soil carbon company on the, uh, on the soy so that it sequesters carbon into the soil that regrow ag can then measure that you know, and you can see here, there's a kind of compound interest that's good that sort of starts to work. And I think one, once you get into your mind as a sort of business person that's sort of playing a role in this emerging system, you can start to layer on all these things. And, it, and quickly, they, it does become clear what the big, what the big areas of, of impact are. Um, and... And I think if we commit to them, as you suggest, then we can we can have a radical impact on on climate change. Amazing, <laughs> amazing. Uh, two, two final questions: Are you um, optimistic about our ability to make the changes we need to make? I am, but you know, I'm always you know I'm kind of famous for being a hopeless optimistic 
football uh, for, for for many people, but I genuinely do. I think we can. Um, I know I know the science has solutions. Uh, uh, that is clear. Um, I think, in particular, when we look at how we all responded to COVID and are responding to COVID, you're seeing that you can that we're capable of civilization level coordination and momentum. Um, we've seen that there's enough money um, to solve these things. Um, and, and so now it's the kind of, uh, you know, now's the time to sort of stand on the hill and have that, that conversation with people to get it done. So I'm definitely optimistic and I'm certainly uh, dedicating myself to um, uh, getting this job done. Fantastic. And um, last question, what's your, uh, what's your go-to salad? Are you a foodie? Uh, and it yeah. could be a futuristic salad you hope to eat one day, but um, keen to get <laughs> what, What's Phil's salad? Uh, this is where I'm supposed to say something sort of incredibly futuristic, like a sort of Galapagos tortoise salad <laughs> with vow food on it. Um, yeah. But I, but um no, I think my I think my favorite salad is probably um, what's that one called that's got walnuts and pear and Waldorf. Is that a Waldorf? Waldorf salad, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Waldorf salad. Uh, that's definitely my favorite salad. I thought you could have said a pork belly salad. I know we've uh, shared a few of those <laughs> about pr prior to it getting our uh, uh, our understanding of sustainability. But again, we there, there can be sustainable pork belly, I'm sure. So um, well, they can, I'll tell you when I, I my investment uh, in Norwich was um, we were talking to the founders and we were talking about pork belly as an example. And I love, I love pork belly. It's not a salad though, Mick. No, no, it's true. <laughs> it could be put in a but, salad. Yeah, but yeah. I do love it. I do love it. And um, and the James, the founder of Norris, told me that what gets really interesting is when you're actually engineering your own lipids, you can, you can, you know, you can make them better. Yeah. Um, so we could have ketogenic, pork belly that actually causes you to lose weight if you eat yeah. it i thought fabulous this company needs to yeah. exist awesome well <laughs> phil thanks for uh, your hard work in the um in the junction between science and venture and especially around food I agree on the on the, the vision it's really critical so amazing work there at main sequence and thanks so much for sharing thank you mick thanks for having me